Welcome to Public Square. My name is Dimitri Bouchade. Uh, my guest today is uh, Jacques Attali, a well-known public intellectual, a writer, futurologist, uh, special advisor to French President François Mitterrand, the first head of European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and actually, among many other things, president of Positive Planet. Uh, dear Jacques, it's my pleasure to have you on Public Square. I would like to uh, have your views about the main security, political and economic consequences of the Russian war against Ukraine. And many years ago, when uh, Russia decided to invite, invade uh, Crimea, and that's more than a simple war between neighbors, it is a war between totalitarian regime and democracy, and the fact that a totalitarian regime cannot uh, accept that a country similar to his is a democracy because it can give ideas to uh, his own population. Therefore, it's a very deep war, uh, between, uh, which is a, a metaphor of a global war between democracies and totalitarian regimes. Uh, the consequences are huge, as we have seen. Uh, for the moment, the Ukraine is, um, with the support of allies of NATO, quite in situation to uh, uh, stand up. It's, we, have, we must admire what they are doing and must help them as much as possible. Uh, what is demonstrating is also the huge importance of Ukraine in uh, the geopolitical scene. Uh, we all have noticed that Ukraine is providing uh, grain what is needed for um, for uh, feeding Egypt and many other uh, African countries. But not a lot of people are, have realized that Ukraine is producing 80% of the corn which is uh, imported by China. Which is, by the way, the reason why China has a very important uh, uh, need for peace in the region because corn is fundamental for pigs, which is one of the most important uh, uh, element of uh, food in China. Therefore, we understand that Ukraine is not uh, is not uh, only Ukraine. It's a key element of a world food policy, which, as we all know, is always a basis for security. If you cannot feed your people, then your political system is at stake. It's why it's uh, so unimportant a war uh, more globally than simple war between neighbors, and not only a war between a totalitarian regime and a democracy. From a European point of view, uh, it has not yet been realized that one, uh, if Ukraine had collapsed, the Russians will have go further to Moldavia and maybe to Balkans and uh, other countries of the north, already members of NATO. And not a lot of people have realized that if Trump would have been president of the US, the situation would have been totally different because the US will not uh, have brought the uh, same kind of support. And the European will have realized that they are alone. Uh, I think what is happening today is um, both uh, an amazing support from the US, but it, it, uh, it should not uh, let the Europeans having the illusion that this American support will be there for, forever. Uh, in another circumstances, with another president, the European would not have been in position to defend Ukraine and the neighbors. And then this crisis should give the uh, uh, feeling to the Europeans that we need to uh, uh, have a stronger, reliable, uh, autonomous uh, defense system within NATO, but more autonomous. 
You have been writing extensively about the uh, French-German relations and also uh, some rifts that have been uh, noticed recently. Uh, and I would be very much interested to hear your view about uh, uh, strategic autonomy of Europe and why President Macron is insisting, as we have seen uh, on this on these theme also during uh, his visit to, to, to China. Well, as you know, and as you said, I am a futurologist and I like to um, uh, put uh, any uh, short-term decision within the framework of long-term trends. Uh, by the way, I just published a book in French called uh, How to Use the World, uh, Le Monde Mode d'Emploi, where I try to understand the world from now to 2050 based on the lessons of history. And the lessons of history are very clear. Uh, U.S. is not going to stay uh, the, sup the only superpower in the future. Uh, China will never become uh, the surrogate of U.S. and will not become the uh, uh, number one power uh, as the U.S. is today which means that we are not going to have a superpower uh, as we had in the past with uh, uh, with Netherlands, then with UK, and then with the US. We enter into a world with no superpower, exactly as at the end of the Roman Empire, when uh, there was no one else for seven centuries, which was not a, a period of decadence or barbarity as it always said, but a period of uh, booming with a lot of diversity. We may enter into that where the market will be stronger than politicians, the companies will really lead the world, which will be a period of kind of chaos. It will not be a G7, it will not be a G20, it will not be a G2, it will be a G0. Uh, that gives a feeling that Europe has it possibility for first time in history to become a superpower. Uh, uh, it has been a superpower, nations of Europe were superpower, but not Europe as, as, as a whole. And to become a superpower, we have to do in Europe what has been done only by conquerors. Europe was united only by conquerors. Uh, Roman Empire conquered Europe. Uh, the uh, we, uh, Napoleon conquered Europe. Hitler did it, and uh, that's not good memories. What we try to do is to build Europe not not by a conqueror but bottom up. Only one nation succeeded to do it bottom up, but Switzerland, who began began by being a bottom up beating some some small part. Of, uh, Roman, of the uh, German Empire, which want to avoid to be part of the German Empire. And it took for them four centuries to be in Switzerland. We don't have four centuries. If we do not succeed to move fast, as we did in the past, because as we look for Europe in the past, we have been the common market, single market, um, uh, Monetary Union, uh, Central Bank, uh, Central Common Currency, Single Currency, uh, Investment Fund, quite a lot of things. But we are lacking, we have even a parliament, and as you know, uh, something like the government. But what is lacking is a real uh, industrial policy uh, and a real defense policy. And the only way to do it, uh, we have for French, Germans, Italians, and uh, some others, but we are the three main participants to that. Uh, we should add Poland and Spain to understand that we should not rely only on the American support. But we should make compromise. French should not try to have a defense industry 
working alone. France should share joint projects with Germans, Polish, and Spanish and Italians more than what we do. And Germany should stop buying only weapons to the Americans as well as the Polish. It's with this vision that we need to build something in common that will create a European branch of NATO that will have self-sufficiency, whoever is at the White House. If we don't do that, there's a risk that in the collapse of the empires, the collapse of the American empire, collapse or decline of the Chinese empire, there will be also a collapse of the European Union. And if there is a collapse of the European Union, then we are back to square one, where Germany and France were enemies with three wars in, 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 the last, in the last century, and even more if we count what happened in the last millennium. It's what I wrote once that I do not discard the possibility of a war between France and Germany during the 21st century if we don't move on in the integration of Europe. Do you see in this in this in this respect also the uh, the launch of European political community by President Macron? Uh, I remember this was an original idea put forward by uh, President Mitterrand, and you also uh, pointed out this in one of your uh, articles that triggered also the. Uh, let's say the, the the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development and all the policies for the Eastern Europe. But how do you see now this new initiative of President Macron into this new context? It's a very good move and a very great initiative that uh, should be supported, taking into account the reason why we fail at that moment when, when we launch it. Because what, when we launched it, um, the idea was double. One was to hook uh, uh, Eastern Europe to Europe without having them within the European Union in order not to weaken the process of political integration of a, uh, a smaller number of members. And it's why we invented this idea of confederation in order to be in position to continue the political integration of the European Union. And also to hook Russia to democracy through the uh, European Bank. The Americans did their best to kill that. They did not want to have uh, a strong political Europe, and they did not want to have a democratic Russia within Europe. I can explain why. And the way we did it, and I was a witness of that, and even more than a witness, I was a player of that, is that the Americans uh, said to the uh, Eastern Europeans, you want to join NATO? Yes, 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 we want to join NATO. Okay, then join the European Union. The Eastern Europeans were not keen to join the European uh, Union. The leaders of that period told me, we, we, we are just out of Comic-Con. Why should we not join another totalitarian regime or bureaucracy such as Brussels? We were against. And it is the American arm twisting them that push them within the European Union. The Americans did not do that for the good of Europe. They did that to weaken the European Union because they say as much as Europe will be um, uh, having to swallow new members, they will not try to become a political power. And that's what's happened. We enlarge before deepen. That was a debate and the dilemma of that period. We would have preferred to deepen before enlarging, but the Americans push us to enlarge before deepening. The Germans were keen, not far from that idea also, because they were very interested in what happened in Eastern Europe. And uh, it's why today uh, the political, uh, the confederation or community would be seen as an attempt to slow down, slow down the integration of new countries in the uh, European Union. I think it's it's a good idea to have a, that as a as a as a as a step within the integration. 
European Union will be strongly uh, will, will be uh, weakened if countries of Balkans and Ukraine join too rapidly. They are too weak. There is too much, too much corruption in some countries of that, of that uh, part of Europe. There are also corruption in countries within the European Union, by the way. Uh, that we need to have a rule of law before. And uh, this could be put as a, as, an, as a global agenda. All the countries of Eastern Europe, Balkans, and Ukraine will join the European Union. We would be proud to have Ukraine and all the Balkans within the European Union. But uh, this should not weaken the process of political and military integration of existing European members. When you, when you refer to the European political community, don't you think that uh, it's mirroring nowadays Council of Europe? So basically you don't have Russia anymore as uh, part of, of this community, but on the other hand, you have countries like UK that is not uh, any longer uh, part of uh, Union and you have also countries like uh, Turkey, uh, Azerbaijan and, and, and Armenia. So uh, how this is going to be seen as a stepping stone for Balkan countries or uh, countries like Ukraine to become members of European Union? Because it's very large in terms of geographical scope and you're, political you're, scope. You're right. Um, what is important is for these countries to uh, to hook to Europe by all means. And what is important to follow is the process of a negotiation for integration. But the other institutions are good to keep the momentum going. Speaking about uh, the position of Europe vis-à-vis -vis US and China, uh, how do you see uh, the future of Europe in this technological uh, competition? So because if we, if we see, for instance, the, the main uh, Techno powers uh, today is they are either in US or in or in or in China. What Europe should do more in this respect? Well, uh, that's true, and Europe is seen by both Americans and Chinese as a market more than a competitor. Uh, we are praise, uh, we are game uh, in a hunting uh, party, and that's a terrible danger we should be more, be more united. The Americans say that they are free market economy. It's not true. Uh, there is a military complex which is organizing the development of technologies as well as in China. We don't have that. We don't have the equivalent in Europe of uh, what the, American, the different administration, uh, American administration are doing to uh, develop their new technologies by subsidies we don't have the equivalent of IRA, even if we try. And it's not only for regulations that we are going to prevent them to come. It's by defending and by building something in Europe. I know that the uh, European Commission is having the same point of view, and Mr. Breton is doing his best to do that. But as long as we don't have enough resources uh, committed to that, as long as we have only a uh, uh, a bank called uh, EIB, which is focusing on uh, climate, which is an important issue, but not the only one. That's why I launched this concept of economy of life, which is a concept of all the sectors that should be prioritized, which is climate, uh, in renewable energy, health, education, uh, um, affordable and healthy food and security. And if you take all that together, they represent less than 40% of the GDP of each country. And we need to move uh, economy of life or thought from 40% to 70% of the GDP. And we in Europe, we have a means to do that. It's only a matter of vision and will. When you analyze artificial intelligence and all these uh, technological developments that we are witnessing, uh, what's your view? It is more dangerous for uh, democratic societies or for autocracies? What are, what are your lessons, your thoughts from, from history? I refer more specifically to the 16th century where the uh, printing media uh, came along with some religious divisions in the society, but at the same time 
Uh, it brought also democracy, enlightenment and, and, uh, and other important elements. So how do you see nowadays? Yeah. Printing machine is a good example because every futurologist of that time believed that it would be stronger, in, uh, it, it was going to strengthen uh, the uh, Catholic Church and the Roman Empire. And on the contrary, it um, create uh, enemies of the Roman Empire, uh, enlightenment, and it destroy the Roman Empire because it pushed to the use of uh, of the local languages uh, and not uh, Latin anymore. I think that uh, it's the same with uh, artificial intelligence. It's going to create much more diversity, much more individualism, and even if it is used by totalitarian regimes at the beginning, as was the printing machine used for input printing uh, propaganda for the church and for the Roman Empire, it's at the end of the day, it will be good for individualism and individual freedom. That doesn't mean that it's good always, because as we have seen, the printing machine was also a way to print Mein Kampf and other terrible books, uh, and as well as uh, uh, we see with, uh, with artificial intelligence, some terif terrifying uh, prospects. It's why in my new book I explain that the real danger is that artificial intelligence is just a new milestone within the global process of artificialization of life. We use prothesis, which we use uh, tools, but now more and more we are beginning ourselves tools. We uh, we begin to have building prothesis. Uh, for our brain, for our weapon arms, and genetics is going to take the lead after digitalization and transform us into uh, artificial uh, uh, life. I'm not afraid of artificial intelligence. I'm afraid of artificial human beings that could replace human beings, and that would be a, a suicide of money. Do you think that Europe and more specifically European Union uh, should do something in order to regulate as much as it can this, this process? Like it, like it has regulated other policy areas? Yeah, we should do that. We should regulate, but we should move on and uh, develop new ways of... Uh, that's why I say we should reorient our activities to economy of life. More democracy, more health, more education more uh, affordable and uh, healthy food, uh, more security. We should do all that. It's, uh, regulation is fine, but we should move forward and have innovation in those new sectors. I would like to ask you something about uh, uh, the future. And this is, this is going to be my last question, also in relation to, uh, to, to the book you have, uh, you have published. So, uh, how how would you see uh, the future of our continent in 50 years' time? What would be the main challenges? The, the, the three main challenges of tomorrow are four main challenges of tomorrow. Are one, climate. Uh, second, uh, dangers of wars and dictatorship. Third, danger of artificializations that I just mentioned. The whole world will be facing that. And uh, in the middle of a period where uh, China will have failed in being number one, where US will be weaker than ever, where India will be uh, booming, where Africa will be uh, the number one continent in the world in the of population. If we do not succeed to uh, move to economy of life, then uh, the climate will be more than four degrees higher. Temperature will be more than four degrees higher than today. Maybe that means that half of mankind will either hell and they will move. It's why we must avoid that future and move as quickly as possible into the direction of the pandemic life. Uh, and if we do that in Europe, we may become the leader of the world. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Au revoir. It was a pleasure having you. You too.